afternoon is Rick Riddle, Vice President of Demand Generation at Sales Staff. Rick brings more than 20 years of experience and energy in driving demand and stewarding customer success. Rick's integrated approach to engaging target audiences, shaping brand attitudes, and generating qualified pipelines for sales teams makes him a valuable contributor to the sales staff executive team. Welcome, Rick. Thank you, Kelly. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today on building the ultimate sales funnel. You know, once upon a time, televisions, or at least televisions at my house, weighed about 150 pounds. They had three channels, two more if, if you had UHF, and if you were a big city. And if we didn't like what we were watching, we had to get off the sofa, walk across the room, and turn that little clickable dial to one of the other channels. Uh, everything was in black and white, including a movie about that little girl in Kansas who got gobbled up by a funnel and dropped into a whole new world of normal. Now, at the same time, there was a clear approach to the B2B sales funnel. In fact, marketing was responsible for filling the top of the funnel with leads by focusing on brand building and name recognition. Sales was responsible for starting the conversation, pulling those leads and prospects through the middle and the lower portions of the funnel through prospecting and cold calling, logging time on the road, and essentially closing business. Cold calling was not only one of the best ways to generate leads back then, it was often the only way. Well, while buyers didn't really like dealing with salespeople back then, they needed us, right? They needed us to share information, help diagnose business problems, develop an evaluation process, and then once they trusted us as a salesperson, they relied on us to help plan the solution. Oh yeah, if, if you weren't one of the very first salespeople in, then your job was to re-engineer the prospect's flawed vision in favor of your solution, right? So, so good luck. So marketing would work harder and harder to generate more leads at the top of the funnel, and sales would work harder and harder chasing those opportunities down through the middle and the bottom of the funnel. And both groups just became even more and more frustrated, and the, the, whiff, the riff widened. What was once a, a very reasonable approach was always really imperfect. Sales was unhappy with the leads that marketing delivered and felt that they were alone in, in pursuing revenue, and marketing felt that sales couldn't convert the leads they did deliver, and they felt all alone in developing a strategy. But essentially, that funnel, if you look at the old black and white days, marketing had very little impact once a prospect came in. It was really up to sales to do all the work. And by the way, the work was a very linear type process. Um, think about it. In fact, think about how you would have purchased software or technology even, gosh, just 14 or 15 years ago. You might attend a trade show, pick up the latest sales collateral, maybe leave your business card, and God forbid if you did, because if you did leave your business card in that proverbial fish tank, the very following day you'd be swarmed by salespeople calling to offer you a free trial or, or some sort of discount or promotion. You, you might have walked away armed with a copy of the latest trade show or trade journal review, but those publications would only go so deep. For example, if you wanted a review on the company's client service team, there was just simply nothing available. As a buyer, you had no choice but to rely on people, paper, and the phone. So that linear process that looks like sheer gravity would start at the top, then comes the phone call, then comes the collateral, then comes the sales process, by the way, after you have that meeting. And whether it was Miller Hyman or solution selling or spin selling or customer centric or even today's insight or challenger selling, you were involved in, in the salesperson's funnel and you were involved in the sales process if you were a buyer, then hopefully the deal got done. Well, guess what? No buyer today. I don't care who you are, consumer or business, would, would want to buy the way they did 20 years ago. I know I wouldn't. And research from our friends at Corporate Executive Board suggests that buyers today are at least 60% through their whole buying process before they even contact a sales rep. So as your buyers change, your approach to selling has also got to change. Now, a couple of data points before we, before we launch into this. So, the B2B sales funnel has radically changed for a number of reasons. Here's, here's three really, really important ones. First, first and, and foremost, your potential buyers don't buy the way they used to. When was the last time, for example, that someone asked you for a sales brochure? So, whether it's Corporate Executive Board or Forrester, um, whoever you read today, they will tell you 60, 70, some even go as far as 82% of the buyer's journey is complete before a salesperson is ever even contacted. We found at sales staff, that it takes, on the average, about 
13, in some cases, to a very complex selling environment, 27 number of touches. That's email, voicemail, phone calls, website visits, downloads, 27 touches before a prospect ever even becomes a client. And uh, the last thing is the sales cycles are getting lengthened. If you're in a complex sales cycle today, almost half of those B2B sales cycles are getting longer for a number of reasons. So your salespeople don't sell the way they used to, or at least they shouldn't. Your competitors, by the way, they don't compete the way they used to. They're faster. They're more responsive. They're more agile. And guess what else? Their sales funnel is full of your prospects. So I'll summarize this way. The traditional B2B sales funnel where salespeople own the process, control the information, ran the flow, it's extinct. Because once the internet came along, it changed everything. That old day of, of black and white and 250 pound TVs, gone. And with the internet came a whole new era of B2B buyers and sellers. We, we all woke up one day and found ourselves in this brand new color cool land of accountability. Everything we can do now can be measured almost instantly. The people who measure us have very lofty expectations on how we impact the business. And that may be the buyers, it may be your executive team, it could be a board of directors, your shareholders, stakeholders. Everybody is looking to measure us and their expectations are extremely high. So forget the line, there's no place like home. It's a new world, there's no place to hide. So <clears throat> funnel, shape, funnel shape notwithstanding. McKinsey, in fact, calls it a, a circle, a 360-degree circle. I do not disagree. Forrester uh, likes to call it an escalator where you run one person through the entire process but thousands and thousands of times simultaneously. I do not disagree. I do, however, like Matt Hines's approach. He calls it a bow tie, an hourglass if you want to, but a bow tie. However you want to look at it, McKinsey, Forrester, Matt, or anybody else, this new sales funnel, because marketing can have thousands of conversations and marketing through all these ones and zeros and digital everything. Marketing has become the, the digital proxy, if you will, for your sales team. They, they are doing a lot more than they ever did before. So this new funnel is multi-directional, multi-dimensional, and, and multi-behavioral. In fact, oftentimes, a prospect will enter that proverbial funnel, not at the top, but near the bottom. So if they meet someone on your executive team and they come in and they've had an executive level conversation, then they're not, they're not a suspect at the top of the funnel. They're, they're very near the bottom of the funnel. So what do they do after they get educated by a salesperson? Well, they don't keep going through the process that you want to take them through. The very first thing they do is they start to bubble upward and they get further away from that intentional sales conversation as they seek additional information, maybe investment ranges, sometimes even recommendations from a trusted resource. And when I say trusted resource, it may not be somebody that they know. It could be just an, an influencer or a blogger. So know this. Gravity alone has never, ever, ever pushed a prospect downward through a sales funnel. By the way, prospects spend a considerable amount of their time online. <clears throat> so in the U.S. alone, your prospects are spending almost 20 hours a week on the Internet. In fact, across more than 644 million websites. They're heavily influenced by online reviews, social content. They have access to, to more and better information about potential business solutions than ever before. According to market research firm Buyersphere, the web is the number one resource of information for B2B executive level buyers today. That used to not happen. Those executives wouldn't go to trade shows. They wouldn't pick up uh, trade rags. They wouldn't take cold calls but they are researching your company right now like never before. Our, our new economy has conditioned these executives to avoid making very risky, costly mistakes. In fact, many of them prefer doing all their own research on these significant investments and then bringing their team in and saying, hey, here's something that I'm looking at. I want you to consider this. You guys take a look at this. Um, CSO Insight says that over 46% today of B2B purchases involve more than four individuals in the final purchasing decision. Influence, by the way, mean more buying complexity. It changes sellers into um, smarter, savvier people, and it challenges them to identify and target each of the buying influence with a, with a very selling approach that, that resonates with each of their very specific concerns or interests. Buyers come to their own conclusions about what they believe is the right solution for their needs way before ever speaking with a salesperson. 
right or wrong, this self-diagnosis, if you want to call it that, frequently leads to suboptimal solutions rather than root causes. In turn, that same self-diagnosis can result in sales proposal requests that insist on a very specific criteria for solution that just simply won't deliver the results that they expect. They've self-identified, self-selected, self-medicated, right or wrong, that's who they are. And so while they're trusting other people, um, they oftentimes reach a solution that, that's really the wrong one. And, and don't forget this too, by the way. Their perception of you may have also been forged a long time before they talk to your salespeople. <clears throat> so just know this, that clearly 90 to 95% of B2B buyers are starting their research through a search engine today. So this digital conversation, this perception of you, your people, uh, today, if you're a buyer, you can actually look at a LinkedIn profile, go to a Facebook page. I, I can look at salespeople that are calling me while we're having a conversation online and they're talking to me about a sales that they, that sale they may want to make to me. I can look them up and look at their picture on LinkedIn, look at their family on Facebook. So this digital conversation that's going on with your company, it's going on whether you know it or not. So, <clears throat> excuse me, so we've established this. The, the buyer is in control where it once used to be a salesperson managing the process and pulling a buyer or a prospect through the funnel, no longer happening. The buyer is in control of their own journey. If you look at this graph here, this is this new funnel that we're talking about. And not only is it a new funnel, but you don't see the sales process on there. I used to always put a sales engagement process on there for my team. This is how you were going to manage the process. Well, now we're being managed. And we're being managed by the buyer because by the time they have, they have researched and explored what they want to take a look at, by the time they've evaluated, even engaged, they've already begun engaging with our brand long before they've talked to, to a salesperson. And what's, I think, the most important thing about this new buyer behavior where the buyer is in control in this new funnel is that these prospects don't come into the funnel and stay there, come in at the top and enter at the bottom. They come in wherever they want, and they can leave whenever they want or leak out whenever they want. So it's more than a challenging landscape, by the way, that the new funnel path is a lot more challenging. There's no longer this straight path to revenue. The new takes and earns. And if your company is still operating, by the way, with a barrier between sales and marketing, your efforts are going to eventually grind to a halt. So it's this fun, amazing yellow brick road of, of opportunity. But you are no longer in control as a salesperson or a company or a solution. The buyers, the influencers, they are controlling. You don't just push the message out there. They'll pull it in whenever they want. And I think most importantly, you can't interrupt. You can't close when they're not ready to be closed. You can't give them pricing before they've got really the, the educational part of the journey done. And you're not solving their problems all the time. They're solving their own problems. You're managing that relationship and guiding the process. These buyers are more empowered than ever before, and they've come to expect a very seamless buying process from you. And they want it fueled by sales and marketing alignment, right? So less than 10%, by the way, of B2B buyers today say they were contacted cold by a seller. Hear that again. Less than 10% of B2B buyers today say they got a cold call. In fact, almost 8 out of 10 said it was they who contacted the seller directly. If your sales and marketing departments can't find ways to muster this bipartisan effort in alignment, chances are your prospects are going to take their business somewhere else. So let's take a look at this ultimate sales funnel. By the way, when I got out of college uh, several years ago, I started my very first sales job. Big company, wonderful brand, glorious group. But our sales department, we were always thought of as the, the engine. In fact, our, our CEO said ultimately that the engine doesn't get out of the garage until sales makes a sale. We were the engine that made the company run. We were the ones responsible for revenue. In today's B2B world, I tend to think of sales as more like the, not the engine so much as the rubber that hits the road. Very, very, very important to get us home, right? But marketing is the new engine that gets the revenue movement started. Buyers are no longer starting at the top of the funnel. You know, it used to be the awareness stage. Now they're, they're, they're aware, they're thinking, but now they're exploring and they're researching very quickly, again, on their own terms, and they're, they're not systematically working their way down. They're moving up and down and through very in very fluid fashion depending on their own agenda, their own wants, and their needs. So this means that salespeople no longer control the process. Your sales process is, is not going to control prospects' access to information 
or their feelings toward your business, your solution, even you personally, by the way. This ultimate sales funnel, so traditional sales funnel, they only reflect half the story. So what about renewals, repeat purchases, referrals, testimonials that, that'll turn one sale into four or five sales? That original revenue is the narrow part of the funnel there in the middle that you see. They used to be the end of the funnel. That's, that's the, the narrow part that you've got to essentially get your prospects through or help guide them through. But if you flip the funnel on its side and widen, widen it again, now you're getting somewhere. I love the way Matt Hines describes this, by the way. And again, it's not vertical, it's horizontal. It's a journey up, down, around, back, through. As, you, as you're guiding prospects through the middle of the funnel for closed sales, focus on delighting those new clients and long-term expansion through the other end. Buyers are changing how they buy before engaging a salesperson. Marketers have more tools to engage buyers during the research process, right? So this shift is creating an urgent need for you to reformulate your old funnel with this new ultimate funnel, and by the way, with a very positive upside. So as a marketer, you can engage prospects during the early and middle parts of the funnel when they're not engaging salespeople, keep them connected to your brand, and ultimately, as they do become a client, you can serve those new clients and those older clients with relevant, current, pertinent, informative content after they purchase for themselves and that they can share with others. Salespeople also can spend their critical selling time with those prospects who are deep in the funnel, engaged with your brand, and, and more likely to buy. So how do, how do we build that? What does it look like? What are the steps? Well, there's, there's, there's about five, five main ones, by the way. First and foremost, you've, you've got to develop an audience of buyers. Think about your ideal client. What do they look like? And by the way, I'm going to encourage you not to think about their just, just their title, VP, director, CEO, CFO, CTO, CMO. Think about the role they play in their company. More and more and more buyers today are hiding what they do from all of the search engines and all the data companies and, and calling themselves different things. So think about the role they, they, they play in their organization. And also, and, and I think even more importantly, you've got to go deep and wide in an organization. And that means people and roles and what we call buyer personas also. So a little bit more about that in a second. But here's, here's, a, here's a bigger thing to think about, data. So whatever that ideal client profile looks like and whatever that database that you build looks like, just know that it's decaying at about 2.1% a month. So keep it clean. Scrub out duplicates, those that, that don't have um, good email addresses anymore, those who unsubscribe. Make sure that your, your customer relationship management system or your contact database, whatever you're using to store this, this, in, this important information, make sure it's deduplicating all of your contact records. Now, emails is the very best record to use for, for, for deduplication since it's unique. Every email address should be checked to confirm that it's real, uh, a real working email address. If someone unsubscribed, by the way, remember that they've got a off email list. That's the law. Um, the can spam laws are, are very specific, so make sure that you're doing that. And, and also, anyone who's on your list because of any illegal collection methods, take them off too. It, it, that's 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 uh, that's just going to get you in trouble, and, and it's going to not only keep you out of the clinker, but it'll, it'll help improve your sender reputation, your email deliverability, and, and of course, your your open and your very very important click through rates. And so, also check for alias addresses like um, support at company.com, team at company.com, or sales at company.com. Most email service providers don't deliver these type of emails because the email address associated with that alias hasn't literally opted in because they can't, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a team address. So they haven't opted in to receive any communication from you, and chances are not all of them really want to anyway, right? And, and in terms of bounces, so there, there's, there's two types of bounces to consider when scrubbing emails, hard bounces and soft bounces. And without getting into an email webinar, let me just say this. If someone is bouncing for a permanent reason, like an invalid email address or a blocked email address, that's a hard bounce. Remove them from your list. They're, they're gone, and um, you're not going to get to them anyway. It'll just hurt your sender score. And if, but if they're bouncing for a temporary reason, like an out-of-office, uh, autoresponder, maybe a full mailbox, that's called a soft bounce. Keep them on your list. Now, keep them on your list, but I recommend monitoring your soft bounces. If, if their bounce rate doesn't decrease, then consider removing them because maybe that email address is just simply inactive. 
Now, I talked about buyer personas under your ideal client profile. Let's take a look at a couple, and there's probably three or four in, in the companies that you're, you're going after. So here's a couple right here, and down at the lower right of each of these particular buyer personas is that ultimate funnel and the stages that this particular buying group is going through. And different buyer personas have different needs, different roles, different tasks, different drivers and concerns, different roles in the company. They also play a different role in the purchase of your product. So you have to know that, and you have to know where they are in the buying process, what role they play in the buying process, so that if these two people were to meet in, in, at the water cooler tomorrow morning, they're at different phases in, in their own buying journey, but you want them both to describe your product, your company, your solution exactly the same. So if you look at you know, buyer persona one, this person's only been with their company for you know, less, than, less than six years. They're a director level. They're a manager of a team versus buyer persona two, where this person is ultimately going to be the one who probably signs that, that purchase order. They've been with the organization for a long time. Perhaps they even founded the organization, or they are one of the original um, employees. They've got a very significant role. Uh, they, they, they're, they're really responsible for, for things like, like P&L, talking with um, boards of directors. They're managing large operations and large teams. They, they have essentially the, the final say. On, on what's going to happen as opposed to buyer persona number one who doesn't really have the final say but they can make some recommendations and by the way sitting between these two maybe is a, another buyer persona who may be involved in that, in that yellow engagement part of the buying journey it could be a technical buyer who may not be able to really influence the decision may not I'm, I shouldn't say the decision may not be able to influence which option they, they consider and they may not be able to sign the purchase order, but they could say no. They could say, boy, you guys have got a wonderful solution and a wonderful option that's just not going to fit within this infrastructure of this company. So I'm going to tell you, uh, even if it's free, it's going to be too much. So you have to consider all of these buyer personas when you're mapping your, your uh, solution to, to their journey. So let's talk about mapping, by the way, and content. By the way, you know that old adage that, that goes, half of my marketing budget is wasted. I just don't know which half. Well, I assure you folks, content marketing is the half that is not wasted. I love what the Content Marketing Institute says. They, they say that content marketing is the art of understanding exactly what your prospects and customers need to know. Then, delivering that content to them in a relevant and compelling way to grow your business. How smart is that, right? Um, that simply says to me, build a fabric of all of your content have that content ready for your prospects to get on their own terms. Some of it, we talk about gated content, if you haven't heard that term before. Sometimes it's, it's some very, very premium content. Maybe it's a white paper that you paid for to have a technical writer write for you. Maybe it's a, a white paper that, that a Forrester analyst wrote that cost three or $400. Um, you don't just want to have it on your website just doled out for everybody. If it's, if it's that what we call premium content, then uh, get something in return for it, not three or four hundred dollars, but something more than an email address. Maybe you ask them what, what their role is in their organization. Um, ask them how many uh, employees they have in their department. Ask different kinds of questions. That's called gated content. So I'm, I'm going to give you my email address and a couple of pieces of other information in exchange for this, this premium content to me. But map that in the fabric of everything that you do. Because this is where you begin to fashion the fabric of that message, by, by giving your buyers what they need when they need it, and on their own terms. And remember when I said earlier that marketing is the new engine of your company? Well, content is the fuel that makes it run. As a rule, I don't read slides. I'm going to make an exception here. Companies win when they treat the attention of their prospects as an asset, not as a resource to be strip mined and then abandoned. Of all the things that Seth Godin has ever written about sales and marketing and client success and just downright cool human stuff, when he wrote this in Permission Marketing, which is the, one of the books he wrote after Purple Cow, I, I recommend, by the way, reading both, I, I fell in love with this because from a, from a content marketer perspective, this is right on, right spot on. When, when a prospective buyer is educated, engaged, even entertained, by the content you provide her while she's learning, you not only shape her demand preference, but you become the trusted advisor by which all others are measured. 
And once you've earned that privilege, don't waste it, right? Please don't. Content marketing is important. But once you have someone engaged with your brand, don't waste that engagement. So next, and by the way, um, disclaimer, I don't own stock in a marketing automation company. There are nearly 100 marketing automation platforms out there. Of course, there's the top five or six, um, and some we love and some we prefer, and others just can't get us there. But I'm going to suggest that if you can, if you can make the investment in marketing automation, please do it. You know, and until very recently, sales calls kind of went like this. A sales rep would, would come in, make the call, anticipate needs, ask probing questions, react to those answers, and then take the prospect through the discovery process that they control, and ultimately end up on a solution that the salesperson wants to end up on, right? So it's like, like, like a magician leading you down the, you know, the, 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 the proverbial rabbit hole, only, only to pull the rabbit out of the hat, and guess what? That's the rabbit that you're going to buy, right? Well, in, in this digital world, marketing automation software really plays that role. And I don't mean doing magic and doing tricks. By, by automating campaigns based on prospect behavior, marketing automation engages and nurtures those early stage buyers until they're sales ready. That's very, very important. All site data, everything, it's captured, analyzed inside of the marketing automation platform. That data is scored, leads are pre-processed. Pre this is the, the technology. So in that engine, this is the technology link between marketing and sales. It's very common for qualified prospects to simply fall through the cracks and for whatever reason choose not to purchase in the short term. In the old days, me, my team, they, they just we forgot about them. Most of the time, I, I might make a note to follow up with them later, put it in the drawer, and, and essentially, you know, it may or may not happen. And anybody who's ever been in sales has done the same thing. Uh, it doesn't matter what we what we think we're doing; it's really what we're really, doing, and we're probably not following up. The heart of marketing automation is this lead nurturing capability. I love the way Marketo describes it. They describe lead nurturing as the process of building relationships with qualified buyers regardless of their timing to buy. Regardless of their timing to buy. So it's, it's doing that with the goal, by the way, of earning their business when they are sales ready. And so it's, it's keeping them engaged with your brand. But while they're shopping without you, you're marketing also at that same at that same level with, without them knowing it. You're, you're engaged automatically with one another. So nurturing a prospect who's engaged with sales, by the way, requires entirely different messaging than nurturing a prospect who's very first time just been in, introduced to your brand. Marketing automation allows for, for actively monitoring those leads that have engaged, including flagging their activity. And when they do display that behavior, or they do say, okay, I'm ready, either either by filling out a form and saying, contact me, or just by reading, uh, by, by downloading premium content, engaging with your brand a different way, you can set up a scoring system to alert your sales team of buying signals. And I think that's the, one of the most important things. And I think what it, the, the biggest thing that it does, it lets your salespeople do what they do best, while a lot of the marketing uh, dirty fingernail, nuts and bolts type work is all being done automatically. Here, here is, here's kind of the way I think about this. And this, this is from Pardot, by the way. And they, they've done a beautiful job of, of laying this out for us in a very, very seamless way. So marketing is coming to work. Sales is coming to work each day, and this is kind of what the, a day in the life looks like. So this, this whole new functionality that, that, that marketing automation has brought to the table for marketers and sales reps alike, it can, it can seem very complex, and it can, and it can often be very expensive. So, so do your homework in, in terms of what you're doing. But if you're not familiar with it, 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 it can look like an overkill, but, it, but it's really not. It's much easier than you think. So, so from a marketing perspective, um, marketing automation allows the, the tools that, that essentially impacts the marketer's day. It provides a wide range of features and support to improve all the marketing performance throughout the day. From the moment they walk into the office in the morning, marketing automation users come in, grab their coffee, grab their morning drink, and, and um, it, marketing automation users are, are sipping coffee while marketing automation is working in the background. And it's actually helping them with really to attack most of the, the most mundane and common tasks and responsibilities of their job. Powerful email, landing pages, um, everything that, that allows you to, to run targeted cross-channel campaigns. Lead scoring and grading helps you pass on the best leads to your sales team, improving close rates and the quality of those marketing source leads. Automation rules 
users take some of the most te tedious daily tasks away, like assigning leads to sales, uh, essentially putting them on autopilot and freeing up time and resources for, for more important tasks and, and projects. Essentially, it allows your marketing team to really go be strategic and really work on, on helping bring revenue into the company. And from a sales perspective, it's, it's kind of like that, that personal assistant. It allows sales to have early one-on-one -on -one relationships with prospects while neither of them know uh, that it's going on in the background. And so if you want to start each day with, with a morning briefing of what your leads are and what they're up to and what's coming in, marketing automation lets you know that. It, it, it also lets you know in real time when prospects are active on your website or engaged with a particular campaign or a piece of content and allowing you to reach out at just that perfect moment. And, and I think most importantly here, marketing automation syncs with, with data, social media channels to give you this, this more complete view. Remember I, I talked earlier about the, the fabric of your messaging. It gives you that very complete view of your prospects than you've ever had before. And, and by the way, it does much more than this. I'm not, I'm not doing it justice. So by the way, am I saying that it's a silver bullet? Um, well, how many of you have, have ever deployed a CRM system, customer relationship management. I've, I've, I've done that more than a few times. Enterprise resource planning. So, you know, if you were in the early days of ERP or even what we called WMS in the, in the 90s, warehouse management systems. If you have, then you probably know what I'm about to say. So I'll speak for myself and I'll just simply offer you some encouragement. When I deployed these systems before, I bought into it, hook, line, and sinker, into the silver bullet syndrome. I believe that technology would magically eliminate all my problems. Um, in fact, when I was a VP of sales back in the early days, of first we called it Salesforce Automation, SFA, then it became CRM, Customer Relationship Management. And I thought, this, I, thought I had found the holy grail. I just got to bring that thing home, uh, plug it into the wall in my office, and leads just start jumping out of the top of the box. I really believe that once I implemented I would have shorter sales cycles, more accurate forecasts, higher close rates. I mean, we all wanted that, right? That's what we were sold, uh, but we realized it was much more than that. In fact, the reality was at the end of a very lengthy deployment for me and my team, we were still left with much of the same sales problems that we had prior to implementation. In fact, I've often said that if, if you have a bad process, then automating it simply makes all that bad stuff just happen a lot faster. Oh, and guess what? You already have a bunch of silver bullets. You have a ton of them. And while marketing automation is a beautiful one, you've got a bunch of them. In fact, you've got a treasure chest of them. Your website, uh, your, your, uh, your experience on social properties like LinkedIn or Twitter, search engines, Yahoo, Bing, Google, the very, the very engine that, that starts your prospects uh, finding you, even your own employees. More on that later. but. First, a word of encouragement. Please don't assume and never assume that technology, not even marketing automation, is the magic cure for solving your process issues. You bet it will help deliver incredible efficiency, wonderful economies of scale, increased productivity the likes of which you've never seen. That I promise you. But as compelling as it is, do not fast forward past the critical phase of, of auditing the real glitches in your business process first. Make sure that you are not automating a bad process. Marketing automation, by the way, has never been, nor has it ever been positioned as a replacement for lead qualification. As a matter of fact, marketing automation makes the lead qualification function way more efficient. That is, it can help qualify leads faster for your sales team. But do remember this. These are marketing qualified leads, not sales qualified leads. If you need something else. So sending a list of marketing qualified leads directly to quota carrying salespeople simply doesn't work. If you send non-sales ready leads to your sales team, you will fail. You will fail. Minimally, you'll get a horrible ROI from your marketing investments, period, period. Something else to consider, by the way. Prospects are coming and going at all levels of your sales funnel. We established that earlier, right? In fact, they're in the sales funnel of your competitors too. We established that, right? So if that's the case, then you have to know there's not an automated anything out there that can keep your prospects from leaking like a sieve if you're not careful. So herein 
in my opinion, lies the very secret to this ultimate sales funnel today. Sales and marketing must not forget that you still need a brain to impact the bottom line, not just an automated process. Marketing automation saves time and resources, but since it's about collecting data and then interpreting it into an automated process, it needs both the technology and the people to bring true benefit. In other words, once this part of the machine provides you with advanced intelligence on your prospect, you've got to apply conclusive knowledge to bring it to life. It's like this. Marketing automation, the new ultimate funnel, everything can be done in the background, but eventually your prospect reaches a point where they can make a decision on their own. They could go left, right, up, down, multi-directional behavioral, right? So they get to this point, if left to their own device, they may make the right decision in favor of your solution. They may not. So this is the point where this, this is the part where it's got to be an individual, a man, a woman, a person, a skillful, motivated enthusiast on your team, someone with the imagination, dedication, the hard work, someone that will successfully provide your prospect with guidance. This is the time when they have to take your hand, listen to your voice, listen to the, the, the voice of reason to help guide the rest of the journey. If you haven't read Craig Rosenberg's blog, The Funnelholic, take that down right now. Um, again, not a friend, not a brother. I have no money in that, but I do love the things that this guy says. The Funnelholic is a wonderful blog, and Craig says in there that you, you can run the best integrated campaign, but you'll fail if you've not built a lead qualification process that includes a solid, crack lead qualification team. I hope you got that, because no matter what you do, if you hear anything else I've said today, everything you do, you will fail if you are passing gold, wonderful, qualified, marketing qualified leads directly, directly to your sales team. If you have the engine, the tires, the fuel, great for you. Here's the warm oil that keeps it all running smoothly. And whether you refer to them as market development, market response, lead qualification, lead gen, business development reps, I don't care. But this is a must in really building the ultimate sales funnel. Sales gets paid to close business. Marketers get paid to send leads to sales that will close business. Trouble is, neither party knows for sure which leads are most likely to close. The key to every lead management process today is to have a human being tied to a phone-based function that sits in between lead generation and the sales opportunity management of those leads. Now, I'm not talking about cold calling. I'm talking about lead qualification. Marketing qualified leads, you've invested all the money developing the perfect database, your ideal client profile. You are guiding them through the process, even on their own terms, without you knowing about it. And now it's time for them to reach that part in the path where they need to make a decision. Have someone guide what they do. What they do all day long, these people, by the way, is follow up on leads from marketing based on a set of qualification criteria, decide which ones should go to sales, which ones should not go to sales, which ones need to be nurtured a little bit more. You can do it yourself, by the way, or you can partner with an experienced organization like ours at Sales App. But either way, I don't care. I just encourage you to include this function. It is the single most important thing that you're doing today in terms of not killing your sales team and not killing your marketing investment. By the way, you can get to 13 or more real touches very, very quickly. The problem is that as, we, as we've already established, and if you've been in sales longer than, than two weeks, you understand this. The problem is that most leads rarely receive any touches beyond receiving maybe an email or filling out a response form, a couple of calls, no response, and that's it. That's where, that's where leads go to die. They go to die in the, in the drawers and the minds of most of us that have ever been in sales. Microsoft conducted a st study, and they do this every year, that shows that essentially by the fourth contact, 89% of salespeople have given up. Nine out of 10 salespeople give up after, after they've tried four times with, with, with no movement. And the reason they've given up is because it's not in their DNA. They're closers. They're not qualifiers. Why make them do this? With slim resources anyway, this is not something that you want your very expensive quota-carrying sales reps working on. You want them focused on closing business. Let's face it. They don't. They won't. And it's a pain to get them to do it. So why force them to do it? Get someone who does specialize in that doing just that. You won't come close with sales doing the initial follow-up. 
You want someone whose sole job it is in life to pursue your leads, engage with them, have intelligent conversations, ask good questions, tie them down to your brand, make, make, make sure they're a good fit, guide the engagement, and then, and only then, connect them to your sales team. Okay, so hopefully that's, that's, that's locked in there. I think that's the most important thing. Um, if you Google integrated marketing, by the way, this is our next step. If you Google integrated marketing, you'll get nearly 49 million results. There's lots of stuff written about integrated marketing today, or named after it. In fact, in my opinion, it's the most overused buzzword in B2B marketing today. That's why I prefer synchronized marketing. And I didn't, I didn't invent that term. I'm an author of anything. But I, I do like it. Synchronization goes beyond integration, allowing the voice of your brand to speak to every prospect through every relevant discipline at every touch point along their buying journey. Now, bear in mind, though, that, that while you're doing all of these things, so you have your website, you're, you're keeping your prospects engaged, you're, you're, you're doing all this wonderful thing, bear in mind that just having your online presence, I don't care if it's a website or, say, a fan page, it doesn't automatically deliver impact to your ideal buyer. I met with a VP of sales recently who bragged about the number of Facebook likes he helped drive for his technology company. In fact, he had a 30-day blitz for his sales team. Yeah, you heard right. A paid blitz for his sales team to exceed a certain number of likes on their, on their Facebook page. So he wasn't happy with me when in that same meeting his CEO was also president. I asked the CEO how many commission checks he wrote that month to all those salespeople for, for all those thumbs up. Now, I'm not saying, by the way, it's not a good strategy. But, but if you are aiming, say, for a million Facebook fans or 10, I don't care, what will you do with them once you have them? And do you even know how they feel about your brand or your solution? If you don't know those things, again, don't do it. Having clear ob objectives and putting in place the right measurement to evaluate success, that's vital to deliver this, this significant return on your digital investments. If it doesn't have an impact on the bottom line, it's simply a waste of time and resources, so don't do it. Any of your entry points could lead to someone reading a white paper or viewing a video, but not necessarily in a very controlled linear, linear order. It's, it's much more important that you harmonize and synchronize all of these touch points. Just like the new digital funnel, it's driven by a, a singular brand idea, never by a campaign. It's a collaborative, cross-discipline, multi-directional, multi-behavioral process. And done right, synchronized marketing will connect the individual touch points of your solution and your brand to your buyers on their terms, and it essentially strengthens your brand across the buying journey for them. According to HubSpot, by the way, companies that regularly blog have over 50% more website visitors than those that don't. In fact, at sales staff, we used to blog some. That was just something that we did. But over the past 15 months or so, we've committed to blogging at least three times a week. Our website traffic has increased by over 300%, and we can track uh, significant revenue we do every month right to that, that increased activity. In fact, our subscriber blog base has, has grown from, from a few to, to over 400,000. And it's a significant part of, of our revenue engine and our new ultimate funnel. By the way, Sales Engine Journal says that there's, there's more than 2 billion people active on social media today. And what do you think the fastest growing community is? Facebook is there. Google Plus is there. Twitter is you know, more and more. The fastest growing right now is LinkedIn. It is your B2B buyers on LinkedIn. And if you're not actively blogging and participating in that, that social community, what I call the, the watering holes of your prospects, then that machine you're building, it's just simply not firing on all cylinders. Now, let's wrap up here with, with a couple more slides. You can't build the ultimate funnel without measuring everything that moves. In fact, even half the things that don't move. So if you take just a couple of things away from our time together, take, take this as one of the really important things. Analytics makes your marketing machine better. It lets you constantly improve results and gives you the proof you need to defend and grow your budget, to, to sit down with your executive team, um, to sit down with your, your stakeholders, your boards. Without it, you're just simply driving your machine blind. So determine what those killer metrics are. R website traffic, email click-throughs, lead conversion rates, whatever. Track them, own them mercilessly because this is the big thing on this slide. Today in our B2B community, three out of four of your 
chief executive officers want you as a marketer to, to not be focused on the website or should I change this this vertical to a horizontal anything? Do I need to change from cyan to magenta? What's the font size on that? They want you focused on revenue. Drive revenue. So do that. And by the way, keep up with, with your competitors. Have have a you know at least a, a weekly time where you go in and look at what your your top three, four, five competitors and those that you've heard might be your competitors. See what they're doing. And not just keep up with them, but you know, leap over them. Do something really, really cool, but but make sure that you've got a set of metrics and, and, and really, really live by those. Because these are the challenges that you're faced with today. And the challenges are, are, are massive. And while marketing is asked to contribute more and more to revenue, marketing is now taking a seat at the executive table and they're being asked to contribute more. More than ever before, you're being held accountable for demonstrating how your investment directly translates into, into company revenue. So that's why fueling your, your machine with the proper analysis systems can help you make critical decisions regarding which points of your demand gen efforts are working and those that aren't, and provide the reporting tools necessary to justify those decisions by essentially connecting them directly with pipeline, directly with revenue. Let's summarize on ways to address these challenges by building the ultimate sales funnel. The machine, in my opinion, that ultimately is going to ensure your success going forward. Number one, know who your ideal client is. Build a profile of them. Have multiple personas of who they are. In, invest in some technology to help it go faster on the lead side. So technology on, on the left hand of the page, if you will, is leads. So lead management and, 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 and lead uh, analysis. Because on the right side is opportunity. That's where your CRM sits and that's where your salespeople sit. On the left side is technology, marketing automation. And on that side is is the link between leads and revenue. You have to have someone in the middle, in the very middle part of that. It's like a baton handoff in a race. So establish a lead qualification group of people. While marketing has one hand on the baton and sales has one hand on the baton, that lead qualification group is sitting there making sure that by the time a, a lead meets a salesperson, it's as if they have known each other for a long time. It's a wonderful, wonderful, beautiful thing if you have that lead qualification group. Synchronize all your efforts across all your properties and, and make it a, a, a very unified effort. And track and manage and measure that often. Now, while buyers have the power, don't forget that you do too. You also have a lot of power to help guide that journey and bring them along. I'll leave you with a story. And if it wasn't true, I wouldn't tell you. At sales staff, we, we drink our own champagne. We also generate sales-ready appointments for hundreds of, of B2B clients. In fact, one came to us recently complaining about their, their low response rate of about 2% on their email campaigns. And by the way, 2% is normal for an email campaign. If you're in the 1.8 to 2.2% uh, range, then, then you're, you're right there with everybody else. So they, they didn't like that, though. And even with their sales reps doing a lot of outbound calling, cold calling, all day long. They just simply weren't moving the needle at all. They were lost in that old world of black and white. They bought lists, and when that list expired, they bought another list. They, they got salespeople to make cold calls. When those cold calls weren't working out, they would fire the salespeople and bring more salespeople. It was a new list, a new sales rep, another cold call. That was it. They just weren't moving the needle at all. By combining an inbound and an outbound approach, what we call an all-bound approach, this fabric of, of everything inbound and everything outbound, we help that client optimize their lead qualification, their lead nurturing, their lead management and handoff process to their sales team and improve their response rate from 2% to 36%. From 2% to 36%. Now, it may not be the Emerald City, but it's a pretty cool place to be. I'll leave you with that, and we will open it up for some questions. Thanks, Rick. That was a great presentation. We're now going to begin with the Q&A portion of the webinar where we will begin by answering questions submitted during today's presentation. Again, I invite e each of you to use the question and answer portion of the GoToWebinar user interface. Our hope is that this will be an engaging session, so please send your questions in. Um, Rick, we're going to begin with um, the first question that was submitted today, and that is, should the lead qualification team report to sales or marketing? 
should the lead qualification team report to sales or marketing? Well, if you had asked me that um, back when I was a sales manager and a sales VP, I would have had a very specific answer, and it would have been always sales. And then once I ran both sales and marketing, I could have gone either way. But I will tell you today, having done it both ways over, over many years, I, I think the reporting to marketing is, is the very best practice today, and I'll tell you why. It's really for three reasons, and, and all of them really are around alignment. So incentive alignment. At the end of a sales period, by the way, marketing is concerned with leads and pipeline creation. Sales cares about whether or not deals get done, closed. So it's in your best interest to align the incentives with your lead qualification team back in the lead management qualification handoff process. Uh, second alignment is uh, metrics, your, your, your KPIs, if you will, so your key performance indicators. When that team reports to marketing, it makes it easier for marketing to be measured, and by the way, compensated, for, for creating sales pipeline. This is because marketing is responsible for everything before the opportunity pipeline. In other words, they're just one step away. So right where marketing and sales have their hand on that baton, that, that, that prospect, if you will, that's the very most important step between a marketing qualified and a sales qualified lead. So if, if sales development reports to sales, it puts marketing's most important metric, sales pipeline, two steps away from their control, and that's just not a good thing to do. And, and finally, the last one is really feedback. With this increased synergy between marketing and sales, um, it means increased transparency around lead quality feedback, which is essential for refining the process. So aligning incentives, um, key metrics, and feedback, put that team in marketing every time. Thanks, Rick. Um, our next question um, comes from Tina, and she asks, what are some of the old school ta tactics that the new buyer opposes? <laughs> uh, good question, Tina. Thanks for asking. And I, I, uh, I like that because I lived in the old school way for, for a long, long, long time. Uh, here's what I consider ditching. Uh, cold calling. Emailing prospects who you've never met, don't know, haven't emailed you, asked for anything. Pushing for a, an in-person appointment or a meeting way too early before they, they really said they want to meet you. It's kind of like walking into a a mall and you're a single guy and you pull out an engagement ring and throw it in the middle of the floor and you know hope when someone picks it up. That's, that's, that's not going to help. And if someone does, do you really want to marry that person? Um, providing pricing, contract information way before the prospect even asks for those things. And, and another thing is that, that, that I used to do, and, and I say all these things because I've done every single one of them as a young salesperson. And, and it worked one day, I guess, and I thought that was the way to do it. But finally, the last thing is, is calling, emailing, uh, way too much when you really don't have a, an objective other than to, to get the sale that day. I used to call them valid business reasons, VBRs. If you don't have a valid business reason for, for making that call, sending that email, and by the way, it's not your valid business reason. You want to close something, but if you can't provide something valuable to that person, th then just simply don't do it. Uh, and, and by the way, if you, if you want to make sure that your team is, is guiding the sales process and helping those prospects make good decisions and not selling way too early, have them ask themselves this question every time before they send an email or make a phone call. Am I providing this prospect with valuable information that will help her make a good business decision right now? If the answer is yes, go for it. If not, cut it. Thanks, Rick. We're, um, we're coming up um, upon the hour, so we're going to take one last question, and that, that question is, I like to advertise my business with every piece of sales collateral I send to prospects. According to this new funnel, should I adjust my content strategy? Wow. Um, comprehensive question. So I like to advertise with every sales collateral I send, and so should I keep doing that with this new funnel? So. I'll tell you this, if you're advertising in any way while, shops, while prospects are shopping, then, then stop immediately. And that goes back to something that I just said about your outbound efforts where you're pushing your message to prospects. If you're interrupting prospects using old school techniques like cold calling, then, then that's, that's not a good thing. Today's buyer is, is not just immune to advertising. That's why TiVo was such a hit you know, several years ago. That's why people record several of their shows nowadays and then over the weekend choose a moment in time and grab some popcorn and binge watch because they don't want to be interrupted. They don't want to be interrupted by, by advertising, including salespeople, by the way. They're fatigued. They're annoyed. They just don't like it. Now, on the other hand, if you're, 
if you're offering to educate people to make them smarter, help them look good in front of their bosses or make them feel safe in terms of making a less risky decision in terms of buying what you do, that now you're on target. So um, I wouldn't advertise in as much as I would educate. So that's how I would answer that question. Great. Um, thank you, Rick. We're going to um, wrap things up. We just wanted to um, thank everybody for their great questions and for attending today's session. If we did not get to your question during today's webinar, look for an email from us shortly addressing your question. All of, all of today's attendees will re be receiving an email later this week that contains the recording of today's session. If you have any further questions, please visit salesstaff.com or feel free to reach out to Rick personally. His, his um, direct line, email, and his LinkedIn is up on the screen now. You can also reach out to us through uh, social media. We have a great blog post um, that we would welcome all of you to check out. We really look forward to hearing from all of you via any of these communications. And we thank you again for attending today's session and have a great day.